Okay, we have a lecture today. We have uh, Martina Gerbino from NFN uh, Ferrara. And uh, instead, it was written that it was some exercise session today. Instead, we have, uh, we have the lecture. Okay, uh, Martina, she is an expert of uh, cosmic microwave background radiation cosmology in general. And uh, this will be the subject of, uh, of this lecture. Please, Martina, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, welcome all. Uh, as I said, I'm Martina. I work at INFN Ferrara and will be here, of course, for the full week. So you're mostly welcome to come and stop by my office, uh, uh, which is at the end of the corridor. I, I don't remember the number, <laughs> but you can find it very, very easily uh, whenever you want. Uh, so the, the subject of these lectures uh, will be exactly the physics of the cosmic microwave background. And I hope that we will have enough time to arrive at the end of the lecture, uh, having explored uh, how the um, system of equations governing the evolution of fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background uh, can be written and, and solved. And at the end, what are the main features that we observed, uh, that we observe in the, um, um, in in the way uh, we um, usually describe uh, from the observational point of view the cosmic microwave background. Uh, so in, in this, uh, uh, what's the, um, the program of this lecture? So in this first lecture, I'd like to provide an overview uh, of the main tools that we uh, need uh, before we approach the system of Boltzmann equations for CMB, uh, which is a very light overview of the background cosmology, uh, and then an introduction to the perturbed universe. I hope that at the end of this lecture, we will be able to arrive to write down uh, the perturbed the version of the Liouville operator, which can be also thought as the um, collision, as the Boltzmann equation for a collisionless uh, uh, species. Then, in the next lecture, uh, we will start uh, um, the topic of cosmic microwave background. So, I will describe in general uh, how we approach the uh, the CMB. Uh, taking into account that the CMB is a polarized radiation, so an introduction to Stokes parameters, uh, and uh, the connection between uh, uh, Stokes parameters and the actual um, uh, fields that we use to describe the CMB, which are temperature, E modes, and, and B modes, uh, and then write down the formal expression uh, of the Boltzmann equation for, uh, for the CMB. Then in the next lectures, uh, we will write explicitly the set of equations both for uh, scalar and tensor uh, perturbations to the metric. And so write down the set of equations for the CMB in case of scalar and tensor perturbations. And, and then solve them explicitly and arrive at the end at the expression for the CMB power spectra. Uh, so now let's focus to this uh, first lecture uh, and I will give you uh, some references in case you need them but uh, since this is a very uh, generic overview of the background cosmology and uh, perturbed cosmology you can easily find uh, this information in whatever textbook that you prefer but for example we can uh, refer to oops uh, Dodelson and Schmidt Modern Cosmology This is a revised version of the uh, standard uh, textbook from Dodelson uh, with uh, new chapters, especially dealing with uh, polarized uh, CMB and the physics of uh, large-scale structures with connection to um, modern uh, observables. And uh, the evergreen Colben Turner, the early universe. Okay, so let's now start uh, with uh, the background uh, cosmology. 
We know from observations that the universe uh, can be considered homogeneous and isotropic at large scales, which means that if we uh, observe uh, at scales that are large enough, the universe appears, uh, or the features, uh, the observational features of the universe appear as homogeneous and isotropic. This means that uh, at first order or at zero order, uh, we can describe uh, this uh, background um, cosmology in terms uh, of uh, homogeneous uh, and uh, an isotropic space. So the proper metric in this case is the Friedman-Robertson-Walker metric, which we can write down in this way. Where the feature of expansion uh, isotropic and homogeneous is encoded uh, in the scale factor, which is just a function of time and then we have this expression here that introducing the conformal time, we can rewrite uh, taking out the scale factor as this way. Now, using this metric and writing down the geodesic equation, which I will not derive uh, here for the sake of time, uh, we can obtain one of the first important results in this background evolution, which is the evolution of the momentum of a species, which scales as the inverse of the scale factor as the universe expands. Then, Moving to the dynamics of this background cosmology, we can derive it from the Einstein equations that we, you have already seen in the lecture by Leonardo this morning, and we can write the usual form. And as you know very well, the Einstein equations allow us to um, connect uh, metric uh, and the energy content of the universe, uh, where the metric is encoded here in the left-hand side, and the energy content is encoded here in the stress-energy tensor. And the stress-energy tensor for um, uh, homogeneous and isotropic universe takes a very simple expression, which is simply diagonal, it's a diagonal tensor with uh, the energy density as the first entry, and then the pressure in the other entries. Uh, sorry, this P is not to be uh, mistaken by the, the P I used for, uh, uh, for the momentum. So this is the stress energy density uh, for uh, the stress energy tensor for a perfect fluid. Then from the stress energy tensor, and in particular from uh, the property of uh, conserved stress energy tensor, we can derive uh, the expression for the evolution of the energy density in different uh, epochs uh, of the universe, depending on uh, which species is dominating uh, the evolution, the dynamics uh, at that given time. And so we have the very well-known uh, result that uh, the energy density scales as a to the minus 4 for radiation, a to the minus 3 for matter, and then it is constant for uh, the cosmological constant. So in uh, as so far, uh, up to now, we have considered the macroscopic description uh, of, uh, uh, of this background evolution, and now we would like to connect this macroscopic uh, description with uh, uh, the, um, sorry, the macroscopic description with the microscopic uh, de uh, description. So we want to connect, uh, let's write this here, macro with uh, <laughs> micro. And in order to do so, uh, we will introduce the distribution function, f, which 
for a universe that is homogeneous and isotropic, uh, as you can very well imagine, is just a function of the magnitude, uh, of the momentum, and of time. Uh, so there is no dependence nor on uh, the position, nor on the direction of the momentum, at least uh, if we focus on this homogeneous and isotropic expansion. Then, having defined the distribution function, we can simply relate the energy density and the pressure to this microscopic description, noting that, uh, as you might well know, the density is just the integral of the distribution function. over the energy and momentum, and the pressure can be defined again through an integral over momentum. Of a proper weighting of the distribution function, where GS is the internal degrees, uh, represents the internal degrees of freedom for uh, a given species. So due to the uh, rapid interactions uh, of different species in the early universe, uh, we know that equilibrium uh, is reached uh, very efficiently, and therefore uh, we can simplify the expression of the distribution function by using uh, the equilibrium distribution, uh, which are the very well known Fermi-Dirac, or Bose-Einstein distribution function. Where plus, as you, well know, as you know well, are for fermions and minus are for, uh, uh, for bosons. Um, from all of these expressions, we can derive uh, uh, the, um, the scaling uh, uh, of the density uh, for, uh, uh, for different kind of species, in particular for a fully relativistic or fully non-relativistic species, because if we insert uh, the expression of the distribution function and take the limit uh, of fully relativistic and fully non-relativistic, then we have that, sorry, let's go let's do it here, that rho is scaling uh, as t to the 4, where t is the, is the temperature of, um, uh, of the universe. Uh, and uh, instead, for fully non-relativistic species, the energy density is simply given by the product uh, of the uh, number density of the species times uh, the mass of the species. Actually, here, uh, we need to take into account that when this kind of expression is derived uh, correctly, the density is proportional not only to t to the 4, but also to this g star, uh, which take into account the, the counting uh, of all the relativistic degrees of freedom uh, uh, at the time at which we are computing the, the scaling of the energy density. Then. From the second law of uh, thermodynamics, we can also derive another important uh, result for the background evolution, which is that entropy is preserved, which allows us to derive, uh, so if, if we consider the um, entropy density, the entropy density can be written as g star s, which is different. In, at early times, G star S and G star are the same, but as the universe expands, the two uh, becomes different. So the, the entropy density scales as G star S uh, t to the cube, and given that the, uh, the total entropy is preserved, we derive that for species that are still coupled to the rest of the plasma, the temperature 
is scaling as g star s to the minus one third a to the minus one. And you might have encountered this result, for example, when deriving uh, uh, the uh, decoupling uh, of neutrinos in the early universe. Uh, and this factor, g star s, is, uh, uh, is very important when you compare, for example, the temperature uh, of the cosmic neutrino background with the temperature of the cosmic microwave background, the former being um, significantly lower than the latter due exactly to the counting uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the relativistic degrees of freedom as far as the entropy uh, is concerned. Um, speaking of particle decoupling, uh, we can use uh, a very simple rule of the thumb to understand when uh, the, um, a given species is still coupled to the rest of the plasma simply by comparing uh, the um, interaction rate uh, of a given species. So for a given species, we can identify which interaction is mostly efficient to keep it in equilibrium. And um, if we compare the interaction rate with uh, the expansion rate of the universe at that time, we are able to understand at least as a rule of the thumb whether the species is still coupled or decoupled from the plasma. Because as long as the interaction rate uh, is much larger than the expansion rate, which means that interactions are much more frequent uh, uh, than uh, the time it takes to the universe to, ex to expand significantly, we can consider that the particles are still coupled uh, to the rest of the plasma. Whereas when uh, this uh, expression starts to hold, then we can consider that decoupling uh, uh, is taking place. Uh, when decoupling happens uh, at uh, um, particular times, so for example, when uh, the particle decouples when fully relativistic or fully non-relativistic, we can derive uh, a simple expression for the evolution of the temperature of that given species once decoupled from the rest of the plasma. Uh, this can be easily obtained by noting that, for example, the distribution function remains self similar uh, when the, uh, the species decoupled. And in this case, uh, we can obtain, uh, as one of the uh, latest results that I will uh, uh, mention for the background evolution, that the temperature of a given species that decoupled uh, when fully relativistic or fully non-relativistic scales uh, as 1 over A in case of uh, fully relativistic, in case of species decoupling when fully relativistic, and this is, for example, the case of neutrinos, or as one over a squared in case of species that decoupled when fully non-relativistic. Then the last uh, thing that I'd like to uh, mention about the uh, background evolution is that in general when we would like to uh, follow the evolution of a given species in, uh, in the universe, uh, we cannot content ourselves with this simple description, uh, especially when we would like to follow the evolution of the species exactly at the time of decoupling, because these expressions uh, are very useful when we consider asymptotic uh, behavior. So when we want to, full, uh, to um, uh, consider the full evolution of a given species, then we are uh, forced to use the Boltzmann equation uh, that tell us how uh, the metric uh, affects uh, the evolution of, uh, of a species, taking also into account the possibility that these species can interact uh, with other particles in the universe. And in this case, we write down the formal expression of the Boltzmann equation, which is the Liouville operator on the right on the left hand side left hand side. You will be patient with me because I always uh, have problems with the left and right. So on the left hand side we have the Liouville operator and at the right hand side we have the collision operator. 
So the metric is entering in the Liouville operator because this is the total derivative uh, um, with respect to time. So when we break down uh, this expression into the different, um, uh, uh, different um, parts on which the distribution function depends on, uh, we will see how the metric enters into the Liouville op operator. Whereas the collision operator uh, takes into account all the different interactions that a species can undergo and uh, we will consider in, uh, in our cases just uh, two body interactions. So for example, one, two, which goes into three and four. And as long as we can consider equilibrium to holds uh, and these, uh, these interactions uh, can happen in both directions, then the collision operator is just identically uh, zero. So we can consider the Liouville operator to be, equal to, uh, to be equal to zero in equilibrium. Now let's write down the breakdown of the Liouville operator to understand where the metric enters. So we have that d, sub d, d over dt uh, can be break down into the partial derivative over time, of course. Plus, in general, we will have a possible dependence uh, of the function that enter, uh, of the function on which the Liouville operator is applied. So, and this function, let's write this, in this way, if f is a generic function that can in principle depend on time, position, magnitude of the momentum uh, and direction of the momentum, then the Liouville operator takes also a contribution where the derivative over coordinates appear plus the derivative over the magnitude of the momentum plus the same term for the direction of the momentum. So this is the generic expression, but since we are focusing here on the background evolution and the universe is homogeneous and isotropic, then we can understand very well that this term where we have the derivative with respect to the coordinates and this term where we have the derivative with respect to the direction of the momentum doesn't enter. And so we are left with the these two terms here. And remembering uh, the, uh, the expression uh, of the metric and the geodesic equation, this simply becomes derivative with respect to time minus the Hubble uh, rate P dP over dt. So in this case, the Liouville operator is telling us that we have to consider the explicit dependence on time, and then we have the term that takes into account the expansion uh, of the universe. And if we then consider that the um, equilibrium holds, uh, and so that the collision term is equal to zero, and apply this operator to the distribution function uh, with some algebra, we can derive again uh, the first uh, uh, result that I, mentioned, that, that I mentioned before, that the momentum scales as the inverse uh, of the scale factor. The full evolution uh, of, uh, of the universe is given, of course, by the Boltzmann equation, but is also given uh, uh, by the Boltzmann equation coupled to the Einstein equations, because we need uh, both uh, the set of equations to understand how metric and energy density uh, are in contact with each other and so influence each other as the universe expands and evolves. So this ends this light review of, uh, of the background evolution. And let me ask if there are questions at this point before we move to uh, perturbations. Let me check. I don't think I can see. 
hand raised uh, in Zoom, so if people attending remotely have questions, please write in, in the chat. Okay. If not, then we can move to perturbations by noting that, of course, observationally, uh, we observe uh, that the universe uh, is, um, uh, is not really homogeneous and isotropic uh, because we, of course, observe fluctuations, for example, in the cosmic microwave background, albeit very small. Uh, you might remember or you might know that uh, the fluctuations in the CMB, in the intensity of the CMB, on, are one part over 10 to the 5. So they are very tiny and even more tiny in case of polarization. But we, of course, observe large large in inhomogeneities uh, in the large scale structure of the universe uh, because we observe the formation of cosmological structures uh, which are uh, by definition not homogeneous, not um, uh, isotropic. So uh, we would like to complement uh, what we have said so far about the background evolution of the universe uh, with uh, um, an extension of this description that can take into account the evolution of perturbations uh, in the universe. Because according to our current understanding, we believe that the universe we observe today was originated from tiny fluctuations uh, that were uh, put in place uh, in the early universe that were uh, converted into metric perturbations, then evolved, uh, and uh, uh, thanks to uh, gravitational collapse, uh, for example, formed uh, the large-scale structure of the universe that we observe today. Um, so we also need uh, um, a model that can describe uh, in which way these tiny fluctuations were put in place uh, in the early universe. So in other words, we would like to have a model to describe the initial conditions uh, of the universe that we observe today. And even though I won't spend too much time uh, on it, uh, we uh, will consider this model to be uh, inflation and the most simple uh, description of inflation, uh, which accounts for uh, one scalar field uh, that was dominant uh, at the early stages of the universe and, uh, and therefore drove the uh, evolution of the universe at the time, but was also responsible for the generation uh, of cosmological uh, perturbations perturbations thanks to the quantum fluctuations uh, in, this, uh, um, uh, in this single field. In fact, in this very simple model, we can think uh, of the initial perturbations that were put in place in the early universe uh, and time shifts uh, uh, in this very single field uh, that was uh, at place in the early universe. In other words, if we assume that at early times, the universe was dominated just by this single uh, scalar species. Then we can think of uh, the uh, energy density uh, at a given time as simply given by a shifting in time of the average density uh, of this uh, uh, inflaton field. So we can write this. Uh, in such a way, so that different portions uh, of the universe uh, saw uh, different values uh, of the average density of the single field because of these tiny uh, time shifts. And according to this very simple expression, it is also um, easy to show that uh, the kind of uh, uh, initial conditions that originated uh, from, the, from this picture were the so-called uh, uh, adiabatic initial conditions where the fractional variation in the energy density of each species is exactly the same. So, for each value of i and j, and what is more, it can be simply related uh, to the fractional uh, uh, variation in the energy density of a reference uh, species. Uh, this will be uh, very important uh, when we will try to uh, connect uh, uh, the, uh, the evolution of the CMB to the initial conditions uh, uh, of the universe. Uh, 
together with a mechanism to generate uh, the uh, perturbations, the so-called scalar per per perturbations uh, that we saw uh, or we sketched, uh, better to say we sketched, uh, originated from these uh, uh, fluctuations, from these quantum fluctuations in the inflaton field. Uh, inflation is also very powerful because uh, it uh, uh, predicts uh, uh, that an additional set of perturbations were put in place and these perturbations were the tensor uh, perturbations to the metric. Uh, so from inflation we have uh, these different kind of predictions which are uh, scalar perturbations that are converted uh, into uh, metric perturbations amplified by the exponential expansion uh, of inflation and then converted back into perturbations in the different species that we observe today, photons, matter, uh, and whatever. And tensor perturbations to the metric, uh, which we will see are responsible for uh, early, universe, uh, um, early universe generated gravitational waves. Um, I'd like to stress uh, that these perturbations uh, are uh, um, both uh, the tensor perturbations and the scalar perturbations uh, are drawn from a uh, Gaussian distribution. So these fluctuations are randomly uh, distributed and according to the most simple model of inflation that we can think of, uh, the, uh, the statistics of these fluctuations uh, is, um, uh, is Gaussian. And of course, uh, in the early universe, uh, uh, this drawing uh, of, of fluctuations was unique in a sense that it was just one possible realization of the infinite possible drawing uh, of, uh, of Gaussian fluctuations was realized, which means that we believe we live uh, in one possible um, universe uh, of the many possible universes that uh, would have been able from a different drawing uh, of initial conditions. So the stochasticity uh, is intrinsic, intrinsically um, uh, stated in this drawing uh, of the initial conditions. And then once the initial conditions are set uh, or are, dis are decided by inflation, then the evolution of these initial conditions to uh, the fluctuations in the CMB, to the uh, evolution of the large scale structure that we observe today is purely deterministic uh, and is determined by the um, coupled set of Einstein and Boltzmann equations. So this is very important because, we, we, uh, we, because it means that uh, when we, uh, let me call uh, X, uh, the um, representative uh, perturbation field uh, that we would like to describe, uh, when we are interested in the evolution uh, of a given perturbed field X, uh, we can decompose uh, uh, this field or the evolution of this field into uh, two factors. One factor, which is the so-called transfer function, uh, which is purely deterministic, uh, times uh, another factor which instead takes into account the intrinsic stochasticity uh, of the initial conditions. So by writing the evolution uh, of the perturbed field in this way, we are saying that uh, whatever initial conditions we have, the stochasticity is here, and then we can simply obtain a deterministic expression for the evolution of this stochastic field in the early universe in terms of this transfer function, which will be the solution of the coupled set of Einstein-Boltzmann equations that we will write down uh, in, uh, uh, in a few moments. Note also that if we are uh, uh, if we content ourselves uh, with uh, adiabatic uh, initial conditions, we have said that the um, uh, relative uh, um, variation of the energy density in each species can be related uh, to the fractional variation of just one species, then we can use the very same species here to take into account the initial stochasticity of the initial conditions. This, apply, uh, this kind of uh, factorization uh, 
uh, applies to each kind of initial conditions, but uh, if we consider adiabatic initial conditions, then we can use just one field here uh, to express the dependence on the initial conditions. So, um, other things that we can say about perturbations, uh, we say that they are small uh, by, by definition of, uh, uh, of perturbations. And since they are small, they can be treated uh, with, uh, uh, with linear theory. And they can be much more easily treated if we, um, uh, uh, if we follow uh, the evolution of their equations in Fourier space instead of real space. This is because in Fourier space, you know that you can uh, convert uh, a set of uh, uh, partial differential equations into a set of ordinary differential equations, which are much more easy to handle with respect to the initial set uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of equations. What is more, in linear theory, uh, each different Fourier mode evolves uh, independently from the other modes. And this means that we can follow the evolution of each Fourier mode uh, independently from what happens to the other Fourier modes. So we can just uh, find the solution for uh, uh, a given Fourier mode and then that kind of solution will be the same uh, for all the other Fourier modes because there is no uh, interconnection between different Fourier modes. Uh, these perturbations, we have said that according to the uh, most simple uh, model of inflation are, uh, are Gaussian. Um, if we single out uh, the average value of the perturbed field, uh, it's very easy to convince you that the average uh, of this perturbation field, uh, uh, once this, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the background uh, value of the field is taken out, uh, is just zero. So in other words, if we define uh, delta x uh, as x minus uh, x average, normalized to x average, then the average of delta x is zero. I will come back soon to these uh, terms here, which represent the ensemble average. And since the field is Gaussian, uh, then we know that for Gaussian random fields, uh, all the information that we can extract from that kind of distribution can be inferred uh, from the second order, uh, from the second moment of the distribution, which is the variance. So we are, and we will mostly interested in uh, finding uh, this uh, object here, which we can write uh, in this very simple way as proportional to a Dirac delta, three-dimensional Dirac delta. Times uh, a so-called power spectrum of delta. So this Dirac, Dirac delta here is telling exactly what I was qualitatively telling you before, that each Fourier mode is independent uh, from, from the others. And the fact that the power spectrum uh, depends only on the magnitude uh, of, the, uh, of the Fourier mode, so not on the direction uh, of the Fourier mode, comes from the uh, rotational invariance uh, of, the, uh, of the perturbation field. P delta is the power spectrum, and uh, we can uh, um, write uh, the variance uh, of delta, which will be very useful when we will derive the power spectra of the CMB. Uh, we can write the variance uh, uh, in a logarithmic bin uh, as the power spectrum uh, times uh, k to the cube. And to convince yourself why this is the variance uh, in logarithmic bin, let's write uh, the integrated form. So let's integrate the power spectrum uh, over D3K, 
then we can expand this uh, as k squared dk p delta k, and then if we multiply and divide by k again, we obtain that This simply becomes uh, the, uh, the variance uh, in uh, the, sorry, let me write this. The P delta becomes the variance uh, of, the, uh, um, of the perturbation field in uh, a logarithmic bin. So uh, according, again, to the simple model of inflation, uh, this model produces a very peculiar uh, power spectrum of initial fluctuations that we can write uh, down phenomenologically in this way. Let's call this first uh, power spectrum. I will use, sorry, the notion of power spectrum both for the uh, proper power spectrum and for the variance in logarithmic bin, but it will be very easy to understand to which I'm referring to uh, when we look at the integrated form uh, of the expression. So the power spectrum of scalar perturbations can be simply written as an amplitude times a power law with a spectral index Ns that um, also from uh, observations we observe to be uh, very close to one. So one of the key predictions of inflation is that it creates uh, a spectrum of scalar perturbations which is called to be uh, scale invariant. Uh, and you can see exactly why uh, it is called scale invariant because if an S is uh, equal to one, then uh, the, the power spectrum uh, uh, does not depend or depends only uh, very feebly uh, on the scale, on the Fourier scale that we are considering. Um, so in case of tensor perturbations, we have seen from uh, the lecture of uh, Leonardo that we need two degrees of freedom uh, to, uh, to describe tensor perturbations. So let us call these two degrees of freedom as H plus and H cross. Um, in this case, uh, each of these two degrees of freedom obey uh, the, same, uh, physical, uh, uh, the same physical properties. Uh, and so we can write down the total spectrum of tensor perturbations as the sum of the two spectra, one for uh, plus and one for cross, uh, where each of P plus and cross, uh, in analogy to what we have written for scalar perturbations, can be written as again the Dirac delta times, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, here. And, and, the same, uh, and the same is true, of course, for, uh, uh, for P cross. Again, in analogy to this color, we can also define the uh, variance uh, in tensor per logarithmic bin, P over T. And again, in the case of uh, uh, single field slow roll inflation, which is the simplest model of inflation that we can think of, uh, the prediction in this case is that we again have a power law um, spectrum for tensor perturbations, where the tensor spectral index uh, is again 
uh, very small, uh, which means that we will have again a prediction for uh, a scale invariant power spectrum. Uh, let me also add that since this simple model uh, predicts uh, the, uh, the field to be slowly uh, rolling uh, along um, uh, a slowly varying potential, the other key prediction uh, of inflation is that both the spectra are so-called red tilted. So uh, the, the prediction is that we will have uh, less power with the power spectrum basically being um, uh, where the magnitude of the power spectrum uh, is smaller uh, at uh, smaller scales, so towards uh, uh, larger k's. Um, and in fact, uh, this is what we uh, again observe uh, uh, in the case of, uh, uh, of scalar perturbations, where constraint uh, uh, on the scalar spectral index can be put, for example, from cosmic microwave background observations, and we observe that this uh, um, full spectral index here is uh, slightly smaller than uh, uh, than one uh, sorry is, um, ns is uh, is smaller than one so uh, the full uh, uh, spectral index is negative uh, which is the signature of the red tilted spectrum uh, okay so now that we have the expressions of uh, uh, of the power spectrum ah, let, let me also add sorry uh, that when we uh, talk of uh, uh, gravitational waves uh, uh, generated in the early universe, uh, we usually refer to their, to their amplitude uh, through the so-called uh, tensor to scalar ratio R, uh, which is, again, a phenomenological parameter, which is simply defined uh, as the ratio between the tensor spectrum uh, and the scalar spectrum. So if we compute the uh, tensor to scalar ratio at a given reference scale, uh, which is usually referred to as the pivot scale, uh, this is simply given by the ratio of the two amplitudes uh, uh, of the tensor spectrum and the scalar spectrum. Uh, Today, uh, as you may know, we don't have uh, a measurement of the tensor to scalar ratio. We only have uh, uh, very tight upper limits uh, on the uh, tensor to scalar ratio, which means that we have uh, upper limits on the amplitude uh, of primordial gravitational waves. Uh, and measuring the tensor to scalar ratio is one of the key goals uh, of observational cosmology. Uh, first, because it will uh, uh, give us evidence uh, of uh, primordial gravitational waves uh, and second because it's a very important handle uh, to um, uh, physics uh, of the early universe and in particular a handle uh, of the uh, energy scale of inflation because if we derive uh, the full expression of the prediction for the um, tensor spectrum from inflation uh, you can uh, find out that the um, the amplitude uh, sorry the um, the amplitude uh, of the tensor spectrum uh, is proportional uh, to uh, a function of the energy scale of inflation. So measuring R will allow us to uh, put constraints uh, on the energy scale of inflation. So going back now to the evolution of our perturbed field, why having defined uh, all these power spectra is important? Because we have seen that uh, since the fields uh, are Gaussian, uh, we are interested in the power spectra of the field. This also applies not only to the spectra of uh, initial conditions, but also to, uh, the, to, the, to the case uh, of the perturbed field that we can observe today in the universe, so CMB and, uh, and MAT. Uh, since we saw that we can expand the evolution uh, of a given species uh, in terms uh, of a transfer function and uh, the initial stochastic field, then the power spectrum of a given perturbed field can be written down as, or better, proportional. as again here the uh, Dirac delta function times uh, the power spectrum of the initial conditions times uh, 
the square of the transfer function or in case we are considering uh, uh, the cross correlation between different fields instead uh, of the square of the transfer function here we will simply have uh, uh, let's call this x1 and x2 here we will simply have the product of t1 and t2 and again this is very powerful because it allows us to uh, separate uh, uh, the spectrum of the initial condition, uh, which is where the stochasticity is, uh, and the fully deterministic evolution of the perturbation field, uh, which is the quantity that we obtained when we solve uh, the system of Einstein-Boltzmann equations. So let's see, what time is it? Um, I think that this is a good time to have a break. So if you have questions uh, at this point, uh, you can ask them now or during the break, uh, as you prefer. And we can reconvene at 3.30. Okay, now we have everything we need to derive the perturbed version uh, of the Liouville operator. First, uh, we need, uh, in order to do that, first we need to perturb the metric, uh, and, um, and then uh, we will derive, uh, uh, we will insert this perturbed metric uh, into the Liouville operator that we have seen before, exactly the full expression at that point, uh, since in a perturbed universe the distribution function will depend uh, in general on all the variables that I've listed uh, above. Uh, and inserting uh, again this uh, perturbed metric into the Liouville operator, we will obtain uh, the perturbed version of, uh, of the Liouville operator by definition. So um, in the case of a perturbed uh, uh, metric, uh, we of course uh, don't have uh, the simple expression that we've seen at the beginning. Uh, so in general, we might have uh, a four by four uh, tensor. So we will have 16 uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, but then we can simplify, of course, the counting of these degrees of freedom, remembering that the tensor is symmetric, uh, so we can discard some of them. Uh, and then we can use the, uh, the freedom to choose uh, a specific coordinate system, to choose a gauge. Uh, and you have seen this already in, uh, in the previous lecture. So at the end, uh, when we apply both the symmetry and the, uh, the choice of the gauge, uh, we are left uh, with uh, six, uh, six degrees of freedom in total. And these degrees of freedom can be further classified depending on their properties and their uh, spatial rotations. Uh, and the classification is the so-called scalar vector tensor. So we have six degrees of freedom and of these six degrees of freedom by considering their properties and their rotation we will have two scalar two vector and two tensor. This decomposition is, uh, uh, is very important because uh, you can prove uh, uh, that a linear order, which is the order that we are interested in uh, in, uh, in our case, uh, the evolution of these three different classes of degrees of freedom uh, happens independent of each other. So in other words, uh, we can um, derive the evolution of scalar perturbation, tensor perturbations, and in principle, vector perturbations without uh, having to care about the others because the evolution of one class uh, uh, does not affect uh, the evolution of the others. And this is in fact uh, what we will do uh, in the following. Uh, let me also add that for the context that we are in, we don't care about vector perturbations because they are not sourced uh, in the early universe. And even if we had a source of vector perturbations, they would very rapidly uh, decay after being, uh, being created. And this can be demonstrated simply writing down uh, the, uh, the evolution equations for vector modes. So as 
as far as we are concerned uh, with these lectures, we will completely neg neglect uh, uh, vector perturbations and will instead focus on scalar and tensor perturbations. So for scalar perturbations, uh, um, since we can, uh, uh, if, um, we can follow the evolution of the different classes independently. Uh, we also have the freedom of choosing different gauges uh, when uh, following the evolution of different classes. And for our purposes, in case of scalar perturbations, uh, it will be uh, easier and more intuitive to work uh, in the uh, Newtonian gauge, uh, in which the metric can be written in this way. where, let me use uh, uh, h mu nu to refer to the unperturbed metric in an expanding universe. So here we also have uh, the scale factor encoded plus the perturbation to the metric, which is this h mu nu. And for scalar perturbation in the Newtonian gauge, we have that the only terms uh, that we care of uh, of this perturbation to the metric are uh, H00, which we write as minus two psi. So we introduce one of the two scalar degrees of freedom, which is psi. And uh, Hij, which we can write as two phi. So we have the second scalar degrees of freedom, phi, delta ij. And all the other entries of the perturbations to the metric are equal to zero. For tensor perturbations, instead, uh, it is uh, uh, convenient to work in, uh, in synchronous gauge. And so in the case of, uh, uh, sorry, this is scalar. In the case of tensor perturbations, we will use the following expression for, uh, uh, for the metric. So H00 is equal to zero, which is also equal to the entry HOI. And then we use the two degrees of freedom for tensor perturbation to appear in the uh, transfer traceless uh, uh, perturbation to the metric, uh, which we can write, for example, and this is again something that you have seen uh, in the previous lecture in uh, this way. So this is one possible choice. Let me also add that we can write uh, this perturbation to the metric uh, as the sum uh, over the two uh, classes of, uh, of tensor perturbations. So we take out uh, an amplitude, which we refer to as HS, and this amplitude will multiply a polarization tensor, which is simply a basis for uh, this kind of perturbations to the metric. So this will be an IJ uh, polarization tensor of the uh, type S of perturbation, where this S will be either plus or, uh, uh, or cross. So uh, from these two uh, perturbations to the metric, uh, the scalar perturbations and tensor perturbations, uh, uh, we can already derive uh, the, um, the Liouville operator. So we in principle need uh, all the terms uh, that I have written uh, up there, and we will try to work out their expression uh, in case of scalar and tensor perturbations. So let's first start with scalars, so let's use uh, uh, these perturbations uh, uh, to the metric uh, and use them to derive uh, uh, the uh, four, actually three, uh, because we, uh, the, the derivative with respect to time is, uh, is trivial. We need to derive the other three terms uh, of the Liouville operator uh, up there. So let's start with scalars. Uh, 
The first ingredient that we need to know is the perturbed version of the four momentum uh, P mu, which is of course uh, P0, Pi. So let's see what these two, uh, actually four, but these two uh, components become uh, in the case of scalar uh, perturbations. We can derive P0 from uh, the usual expression G mu nu. Remember that G mu nu is the full metric uh, which now encodes uh, perturbations, scalar perturbations uh, to it. So this is the usual on-shell expression, uh, which in the case of a uh, massless particle is, uh, is simply equal to zero. So from this expression and using uh, the expression of the full metric here, we obtain uh, the following. So remember that this can be written as G00, P0, blah, blah, plus uh, all the other terms. So at the end, uh, since the only perturbations live uh, in H00 and Hij, we are left uh, with the following, minus one plus two psi by zero squared, plus small pi square, equal to minus m square, where the small pi square is g i j pi i j. So considering now that psi is a small perturbation to the metric, from here, we can derive uh, an expression for pi zero, which is uh, pi square plus m square. This is simply the energy of the particle divided uh, one plus two psi square root. But again, since psi is a small perturbation, this simply gives uh, e times uh, one minus psi. So pi zero in the case of scalar perturbation is given by this expression here. Now we derive pi e and we can use again what I've written there so that small pi square is g i j pi e pi j. And again, using the expression of the perturbed metric, this simply becomes uh, a square t delta ij plus two phi delta ij. And so again, here, if we extract the expression of, uh, uh, of pi e, and remember that phi is a small perturbation, we can write that pi e is equal to one minus phi small p over a, where the small p is the magnitude of the momentum, so we have factored the uh, i component uh, of the form momentum into a term that is proportional to the magnitude times uh, the direction uh, of the form momentum. So this is the expression of uh, pi in case of uh, scalar perturbations. At this point, we have everything we need to compute, for example, dxi over the t and then dp over dt because dxi over dt will simply be if we use 
an affine parameter to factorize uh, this derivative. This is clearly pi e, the first term here is pi e, and the second term here is simply the inverse of uh, pi zero. So we use the expression that we have just derived for the perturbed version of pi e and pi zero, and we end up with uh, the following expression for the derivative uh, dxi over dt. The other term that we need is dp over dt and dp over dt direction. So let's first start from the full expression of dpi over dt. This again can be factorized as dpi over d lambda, d lambda over dt. where again, this is one over pi zero. And we have seen that pi e can be written as a term that depends on the, um, on the, on the magnitude and the terms that depend on the direction. So this will be a one, sorry, this is a plus one plus phi, no, this is a minus. Yeah, this is a minus because I use this expression to factor out uh, pi e as a term that depends on p and the terms that depend on the direction and I obtain this factor here that depends on the magnitude from the expression of, uh, uh, of pi e. So again, this can be further simplified where pi zero is the energy. And here I can apply, sorry. Here, sorry, I can apply the derivative to the two terms uh, once at a time. So I have one plus phi, the derivative acting on pi e. And this derivative here can be obtained from the geodesic equation. Plus the other term, which now has pi e, times the derivative acting uh, on the perturbation to the metric. Okay, now to further simplify this expression, let me use this term here. What time is it? Okay. Let's observe that at this point, uh, dp over dt Again, can be written in this way. Just remember the definition of the 
small p. So this is delta ij. We extract uh, pi over p, and this is the pj over the t. This is just algebra, nothing uh, particularly deep. But if we use uh, now this expression and combine it uh, with what we have found before, we can obtain the other term that we need for the Liouville operator, which is dp over dt. And finally, we arrive to some physics, because if we do the algebra and consider also the geodesic equation there, then here we have minus h, the Hubble rate, times the time derivative of phi, times p minus e over a direction of pi and space derivative of the other scalar function psi. So this expression is very interesting because it is telling us uh, how the perturbed metric is changing the magnitude of the momentum of a particle. There are two different terms uh, uh, that are responsible for the variation of p uh, in the perturbed uh, expanding universe. The first one here is a revised version of the Hubble friction that we have seen at the beginning. Remember that in the case of uh, isotropic and homogeneous universe, we have that uh, dp over the t, we can also obtain it directly from here, is simply minus h p. So this was the case uh, of homogeneous uh, and isotropic uh, universe. So the variation uh, of the momentum in an expanding universe is due exactly to the expansion of the universe. It's the so-called Hubble friction term. Here, we have a revised version which takes into account the fact that we are perturbing uh, uh, the metric. Uh, and we can simply see this uh, by remembering that uh, gij was exactly a square delta ij 1 plus 2 phi. So this can be written in some sense uh, in terms uh, of a modified uh, um, scale factor as delta ij a squared uh, revised scale factor where the revised scale factor uh, is a function of the original uh, unperturbed uh, scale factor times uh, the scalar perturbation to the metric. So if we write uh, the new scale factor in this way, and again remember that phi is a small perturbation to the metric, uh, this simply becomes uh, a times uh, 1 plus phi plus phi. And so, when we compute uh, the Hubble rate uh, with this revised version uh, of the scale factor, remember that the, the Hubble rate uh, is uh, a dot over a. So if we compute the Hubble rate in this revised version of the scale factor, then with some algebra, you can easily find uh, that is not only h, but a correction which depends on the time derivative of phi appears. So this is basically telling that in a perturbed universe uh, with scalar perturbations, the Hubble friction uh, must, be, uh, must include also the contribution from the perturbation uh, to the metric. The second term here is also interesting because it's the term that encodes the so-called gravitational redshift. So this second term is telling that uh, apart from uh, the uh, change 
in the momentum with time due to the expansion of the universe, the fact that we have changing uh, gravitational potentials uh, in the universe, or better, that the metric, uh, the scalar part of the metric is perturbed uh, with this new scalar degrees of freedom that in principle is of course uh, uh, coordinate dependent is introducing an additional source of variation uh, to the momentum. Uh, you can easily understand this by thinking that now photons or whatever particle is traveling through uh, a metric which has uh, um, changing potential. So uh, if you think of a photon, for example, that has to travel through these uh, potential uh, throws and wells, uh, you can imagine that in case of uh, photons having to fall uh, into uh, these, uh, these potential wells, so uh, in case of photons, uh, where this uh, uh, derivative uh, is, uh, is negative, uh, photons gain energy because they are uh, falling into forming uh, potential wells. So, so it's a sort of uh, uh, blue shift, but of gravitational uh, origin. Uh, instead, um, in the other, um, uh, on, the other, uh, on the other hand, uh, if you have a photon that is climbing out a potential well, so if we consider the positive uh, sign of this derivative with respect to coordinate, then the photon is losing energy uh, because it has to climb out uh, this potential well. In this case, we have uh, the proper uh, redshift. Then we define redshift regardless whether uh, it is blue shift or redshift properly, uh, but the physical origin is exactly the fact that we now have uh, a spatial perturbation to the metric that is responsible for this additional source uh, of uh, momentum change. So this is the term uh, uh, that we need to insert into the Liouville operator. And finally, we have just one minute, but we have time just to write down uh, the expression for the final term that we need uh, for the Liouville operator, which is the derivative of the direction over time. This can be easily obtained if you again remember that the direction is simply given by the ratio between uh, the full uh, spatial component of P divided by the magnitude of P. And again, with some algebra, you can simplify that this is expressed in this way, E over AP times delta IJ minus direction pi i, direction pi j, times p square over e square phi minus psi, derived with respect to the uh, k component uh, of, uh, of the metric. Sorry, so this is k uh, here. This uh, is another important result uh, of uh, scalar perturbations uh, uh, that induce a change uh, in the direction uh, of the momentum in this way. And again, the change uh, is only non-zero if the uh, derivative, uh, uh, the spatial derivative uh, over the k component uh, of terms uh, that depend on the fluctuations uh, uh, to the metric uh, uh, are non-zero. So if we have gradients of the gravitational potential in this expanding and perturbed universe, this will change, will bend uh, the direction of, uh, uh, of moving particles in the universe. If we again think of photons, this is basically telling us that photons uh, will undergo uh, the um, effect of gravitational lensing. Forming structures in the universe will uh, uh, induce uh, uh, gradients uh, of, uh, uh, of the metric uh, or uh, in, this, in this case uh, perturbations to the scalar part of the metric uh, will uh, have non-vanishing gradients uh, uh, of the uh, gravitational potentials and therefore we expect uh, that photons uh, will be bended uh, in their trajectories due to uh, these, uh, these gradients uh, uh, of the gravitational potentials. And uh, this 
and the derivation of the perturbed UV operator in the case of scalar perturbations. And tomorrow we will complete uh, this lecture with uh, the expression in case of uh, tensor perturbations. It won't take uh, too much because we have all the tools that, uh, that we need, more or less. Um, so if you have any questions or uh, comments, I'm available either now or later or in the, in the next days. Thank you so much.